Well, I definitely think um, the building is a kind of a cropping mechanism. Um, the idea of learning in general is so vast and inexhaustible that the minute we get inside of a building and we're limited by not only the walls but the what can be expressed within a controlled space makes lessons far more um, intentional um, and therefore allows us to have some sort of consistency uh, amongst everyone that's involved. Even on a more basic level than that, it's a backdrop. It's not really active all the time in our, in our minds. Whereas teaching might seem like a, um, an activity that happens within a space, the space itself has a direct influence on the nature of the activity. So a one-room schoolhouse has a very different type of education and feeling than uh, inner city high school with several hundred students in it. Can a vacant building be a place for education? Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a blank canvas. So as you said before, you're, you know, it's broadening your spectrum of what you can do in that space. So in just more of a literal sense of an open, empty building that is kind of broken down and not much in it, sure, you can use that empty space as whatever you want. But what, what, what can you teach there? Is more the question. But also the history part of it too, kind of like blank canvas that there was something going on there at one point, and at one point or another, I mean, there, there's still a history to it that, that I think that still is valid to study upon as, a, as educational. Um, a lot of times I think vacancy is empty, but as you brought up, it draws a whole bunch of attention to the vacancy, and that on, in, almost in uh, counteraction mm -hmm. highlights the fact that there was something there. It's kind of a presence of an absence multiple layers to what happens in education. One of them is the transferring of specific info from you know, one person or a source to a student. But in terms of being in school, uh, being in a classroom, there's also this kind of meta layer of just social interaction. So when you're in school, you're a student, you have a large peer group, you have another layer of people that are above you, um, and you're there every day and you learn how to navigate that. And by taking out the human interaction aspect of education, then that's a big part of social learning. You know, even if there wasn't a topic being discussed, there wasn't information being transferred, but just being in that situation where you have a lot of different people um, and kind of a hierarchy of people that you then have to figure out how you fit into that and how, to, how it affects you, how to use it, so it's a big trend right now to have K through eight schools instead of you know K through five and then a middle school and then a high school to try to keep students together for longer periods so that when you're a kindergartner you see the older students you have role models and then as you grow you're kind of passing younger kids in the hall you have to learn to be you know kinder to them you still see your first grade teacher when you're in eighth grade so you're kind of you know, you still have, okay, Mrs. Jones, I, you know, I, I'm still trying to be that good boy that you remember from first grade. <laughs> so trying to kind of, kind of humanize kids as they grow up so they're not just kind of segregated with their own age group. So there is something to be said about having schools that are capable of, you know, keeping that number of students um, over that span of time. And this is outside of the traditional educational conversation, but, you know, the new media can kind of bring knowledge and bring education into more aspects of someone's day. So if you look at the games that people play on their iPads, you know, there's some educational aspects being worked into those. So, you know, if you have a generation of kids that are growing up really familiar with the screen, you know, that's an opportunity to kind of um, get them in the classroom, you know, outside of the classroom. So it spreads it out during the day and into other aspects of, uh, of play, and et cetera. Yeah. I don't think about it too in terms of the user or just people in general, because uh, there's this theorist and if the lineage of communication first was orality, then went to literacy, people reading and writing, and now we're kind of in what he calls electricity, which is all basically all three in digital media. 
So I would think about different generations and how they might experience that differently. Um, kids are used to having all this media and information at their fingertips, which um, we didn't really have that necessarily when we were really little. So that might impact how you think about program and the user. To expand on that, maybe uh, the digital media is a great way to transfer huge amounts of data and in just basic um, unanalyzed information very quickly um, through text, through video, through speech, through all of that. But it, uh, it carries much less emotional impact than oral communication, and it carries much less intentionality maybe than literary communication. 